So welcome everyone, my name is Simon Dennis and today I'm going to be talking about modelling memory for wear. So in 1984, Ronald Cotton was convicted for two counts of rape and two counts of burglary. He was sentenced to life plus 50 years. Cotton was exonerated in 1995 after spending over 10 years in prison when DNA evidence demonstrated his innocence. In addition to three false identifications, Cotton also misremembered where he had been at the time of the crime, leading jurors to the conclusion that he was lying. So rather than um, say where he had been when the crimes were occurring, he'd accidentally recall where he was the week before. Now, what we'd like to do is have a memory science that's capable of addressing um, these kinds of issues in a quantitative way. And we can gain some lessons from the laboratory, but if we really want to understand um, how these issues work in the real world, we need to go out and collect data um, as people go about their everyday lives. And so that's what we did. So we uh, people collected for two weeks and we had accelerometry vectors collected 10 times a second continuously, so about 25 million data points per subject. We had GPS coordinates um, collected every 10 minutes, so a bit over 4,000 pairs per subject. And then audio segments, so these are short three second segments um, every 10 minutes also. And um, we also uh, had people uh, rate eight times a day on um, their, uh, the degree to which they're experiencing 11 discrete emotions. You can see those there. So then we um, asked them to complete a memory test and each of the trials in the memory test asked them where they were at a specific time. So in this case, Thursday morning, 8 a.m. on August 15th. And you can see there were four alternatives. That all of the alternatives are places that this per this person had been before, and they had to choose which one and um, they where they'd been at that particular time. Um, they were correct 67 uh, percent of the time, um, which of course means they are incorrect about a third of the time, um, and just uh, lends further credence to the idea that people are not perfect uh, by any um, stretch of the imagination in making these kinds of decisions. Um, if we look. At when they gave the wrong week but the right day, we find that that happened about 19% of the time. And so that's the error that Cotton made. And so in fact, that's well above chance and suggests that, um, that that's a likely error that we should be looked on guard for. Now to model this, what we did is constructed a memory um, network and the nodes in the network were um, generated by the um, data that we created. So we had nodes for accelerometry, audio, and GPS clusters. And um, we had nodes for the hours of the day, the days of the week, and the weeks. And we had nodes for the 11 discrete in motion. Um, to connect the nodes, we um, didn't simply just connect them with some kind of Hebbian rule because the um, distribution of the data is such that high frequency things are very um, highly represented. And so they would simply overwhelm the network if we did that. So what we did is we instituted um, a max degree rule. And so only the M um, most frequently co-occurring nodes were connected to any given node. So in this case, M is 10. And then to decide upon the strength of those interconnections, we parameterized that um, as part of the model fit. And we had a separate parameter for each of the different kinds of connections. So, um, so there'd be a parameter for the audio to emotion link. There'd be another parameter for um, time, for the um, time to uh, location links and so forth. Now, what we want to do is we want to um, start with the queues and have um, activation spread through our network until it gets to the uh, to the possible responses, and then see how strong those responses are. And the most straightforward way to think about doing that is um, through a power iteration. So we take the um, state in the initial state as the um, representation of the queues, and then we keep multiplying that by the weight matrix, updating the state, doing that again and again, and normalizing on each occasion. And um, so that's the most obvious thing to do. Now there's a, a clear problem with doing that though, and that is that um, regardless of what input you give the network, uh, you will always end up at the primary eigen uh, vector of the weight matrix. And so a, a memory system that can only ever give you one possible response um, is not particularly useful. And so this has been known for a long time. In the 1960s and 70s, Hopfield and Anderson introduced um, the Hopfield network and the brain state in the box. 
um, in order to deal with this problem. And so what they did is they uh, brought in non-linearity. So instead of um, normalizing, they had the uh, state of the system go to one of the corners of a hypercube. Now, what we'd like to do though, is be able to have a graded response to each of our activations. And so we prefer not to have them go to those uh, corners. And so instead, what we did is we temporarily updated the weight matrix um, to dynamically alter the eigenstructure. So we took the um, pattern representing um, the queues, so 3 p.m. Monday and week 35. We take the outer product of that with itself and we add that temporarily to the weight matrix. We then go through the recurrence, find the primary eigenvector, and that's the um, state that you're seeing here. So each of the um, nodes here is shaded according to their activation in the primary uh, eigenvector. Um, now it's a bit hard to uh, see what's going on with all of the links in there. So what I've done is just uh, redrawn the graph, but with only the links that emanate either from a cue or a response, and that helps us to understand what's going on. So to simulate this particular trial, we would have put in the queue, 3 p.m. Monday and, and week 35 and we would have um, cycled. And what we're interested in is the blue nodes, which are the ones that represent the possible response options here. Now you'll notice that um, the network thinks that um, GPS uh, position D and GPS position B, or option B and D, are the most likely, and it's, it's quite uncertain as to which of these two are, um, are correct. So in this case, it, it is the case, um, it's true that uh, D was correct, but in fact, the uh, participant responded B at this, at this um, trial. Now, if you look at it, you can see why that might have happened. So I'm going to speculate that GPS position D is the uh, participant's home. And I say that because it's connected to Sunday and to Saturday and to relax and to happy. Um, whereas GPS position B, um, I'm going to speculate is the, uh, the participant's uh, work. And I'm going to say that because it's connected to Monday and to Friday and also to all of the uh, work time hours. So you can see that um, usually at 3 p.m. on a Monday, the participant would be at work. Uh, but on this particular um, trial, the participant was um, at home. And so I think that's why uh, the participant made the error in this case. And you can see that that's also leading to um, uncertainty in the structure of the network. So we went through and did this for uh, all of our trials um, from all the participants, and the model was correct um, a bit over 51% uh, of the time, and so in this case, chance is uh, 25. So we're clearly capturing something about the nature of the memory process. Um, we have the parameters that we fit um, to, uh, in order to maximize our performance there. And um, so these are the parameters of the um, link strength between the different modalities. And you can see that there's quite a strong um, connection between GPS and time. So that might be expected to give in the task. But there's also um, even stronger connections from uh, time to emotion and audio. There are strong connections from accelerometry and audio onto emotion as well. So uh, it really is the entire network that's, that's generating the responses. Um, you'll also notice that there's uh, very little activation in the emotion to emotion um, connections. And that suggests to me that there may be a problem with our emotion representation. We need to look at that. So after a one to three week retention interval, people were able to identify where they were about two thirds of the time. So there's um, an important uh, applied result right there because um, it's critical that we understand how reliable people are when they're giving their alibi. Um, the dynamic eigen network with the max degree rule captures about 51% um, percent of participant choices. And I think what it does is it exemplifies a system in which generalization is happening at retrieval rather than encoding. And so what we're speculating is that um, a large portion of generalization happens through the dynamic reconfiguration of the eigenstructure of the memory network um, as a consequence of short-term plasticity. Um, more well, generally, I think using experience sampling allows us to make models that are informed by the structure of a um, individual's environment. And in general, I think we've, um, we've lacked the ability to um, really understand how environment uh, impacts um, memory performance in a detailed way. Thanks for listening.